Seorang ibu yang sangat-sangat sabar. Bapak, siapa itu orangnya pedas? Jadi dari beliau kami banyak pendidikan mengenai masalah politik. Oh ya di sini makam ibu dan bapak. Ya si ibu Siti Amina dan bapak Sukrisno. Ada suatu harapan mungkin bisa ke Indonesia lagi. Tetapi, ya beliau kedua-duanya sudah tidak ada. Itu satu segi. In the 1960s, thousands of Indonesians were exiled from their country, accused of being communist sympathizers. Karena itu akan menyebabkan dengan teori domino, Indonesia dan Singapura, Malaysia itu akan kemudian menjadi komunis. Secara umum, kita kan diitukan sebagai pendukung komunis. Now, in the twilight years, President Joko Widodo has offered an olive branch to these exiles, an acknowledgement of past injustice and an offer to reinstate the citizenship. Negara harus minta maaf. Yang berikutnya, para penjahat kemanusiaan ini harus diadili. But with many exiles already in their twilight years, is it too little, too late? In this quaint suburb of Amsterdam, 74-year-old Siti Krisnowati or Wati lives with her husband, Sunkono. Wati is the daughter of Sukrisno, Indonesia's first ambassador to Romania and North Vietnam. Ya, pertama misalnya dalam dari segi pemandangan, saya merasa Romania itu terkenal juga sebagai Parisnya di Eropa Timur. Jadi memang pemandangannya indah, banyak taman-taman, bunga, ada danau. Four years later. Wati's father was assigned to establish an embassy in Hanoi, North Vietnam. Because the country was at war, Wati, her sister, younger brother and mother stayed in Indonesia. But the 60s were a turbulent period for Indonesia, then ruled by founding president Sukarno. In the 60s, especially when we are talking about the guided democracy period, this is from 59 to 65, as far as the ideology is concerned, it began to be more polarized. And the economic situation was not getting better, but getting worse. At one time, the inflation rate, I think, was up to more than 500%. President Sukarno's hold on power was precarious. So, he aligned himself with the increasingly influential Indonesian Communist Party, known as the PKI. Sukarno, I think, indeed become more and more look like not only a, a socialist, but he wanted to move Indonesia toward the left-wing camp, cooperating with the People's Republic of China. So this kind of uh, situations, I think, from the liberal anti-communist point of view, this is very alarming. So they wanted to stop this as well. Ada perang dingin. Ada uh, konflik antara Blok Barat dengan Blok Timur. Blok Barat yang dikuasai Ameri uh, yang dipimpin Amerika dengan Blok Timur yang uh, dikomandoi oleh uh, Uni Soviet. Nah, Amerika itu tidak menginginkan Indonesia jatuh ke tangan komunisme. Karena itu akan menyebabkan dengan teori domino, uh, Indonesia dan Singapura, Malaysia itu akan kemudian menjadi komunis dan menyebabkan Amerika itu menjadi terkepung. PKI had emerged as the world's largest communist party outside the Soviet Union and China. As it grew in strength, PKI became embroiled in a power struggle with the military and Islamists in Indonesia. 
Nah, saya sendiri uh, melihat bahwa uh, ketika itu uh, memang uh, kekuatan terpusat pada tiga uh, aktor. Yang pertama Presiden Soekarno, yang kedua uh, Angkatan Darat, dan yang ketiga PKI. Soekarno berusaha menjaga keseimbangan antara PKI dan Angkatan Darat. Dan keseimbangan itu menjadi goncang atau goyah pada tanggal 30 September tahun 65. That day, 30th September, it all came to a head. A day of infamy recreated in these museums in Jakarta. Members of an armed group calling itself the 30th September movement kidnapped and killed six of the most senior army generals and one lieutenant. Who was behind the attack is debated to this day, but the official version held the PKI responsible. Ada beberapa orang jenderal yang akan melakukan uh, kudeta pada tanggal uh, 5 Oktober uh, tahun 65. Dan uh, apa yang terjadi pada tanggal 30 September itu sebetulnya adalah uh, tindakan pendahuluan yang dilakukan oleh uh, Biro Khusus PKI uh, bersama dengan uh, perwira yang sudah mereka bina untuk melakukan penangkapan terhadap uh, beberapa orang jenderal itu dan kemudian menghadapkannya uh, ke Presiden Soekarno. The attack was characterized as an attempted coup and the army reacted quickly. Led by then little known general Suharto, the army crushed the 30th September movement in days and began one of the darkest chapters of Indonesian history. In the aftermath, communists and their alleged sympathizers faced retribution across the archipelago. At least half a million people were killed between 1965 and 1966 in one of the worst massacres of the 20th century. Millions were detained without trial. As Suharto's military faction sought power, the purge would include Sukarno loyalists. I think it is important to point out that the whole process in fact was the not only the elimination of the PKI but the elimination of Sukarno and Sukarnoese. So the coup in fact had two major objectives here. One is to eliminate the PKI and also the Sukarnoese. As violence intensified in January 1966, Wati, her mother, sister and younger brother fled to China. Bapak ke Tiongkok itu saya kurang ingat persis bulannya. Bapak sudah banyak mendengar pembunuhan-pembunuhan. Sehingga merasa kok seperti ini kelanjutannya. By 1966, the military was in de facto control. And in February 1967, Sukarno was forced to resign. Suharto became the acting president. Wati's father, Sukrisno, refused to support the new government and was declared persona non grata. He and his family became political exiles. If they return, they uh, run the risk of uh, per persecution, imprisonment and murder. Yeah? So that's, that's a political exile. Indonesian government accused them of being communists and worse, of being involved in the what they call the Gate Gabulu SPKI. At this time, Wati's future husband, Sunkono, was thousands of miles away. He was among some 30 Indonesians sent by Sukarno's government to study in the Soviet bloc. Sunkona was pursuing engineering in Moscow, far removed from the turmoil at home. But a few months after the coup, the Indonesian embassy in Moscow asked him and other students to attend a screening process. Screening ini tentunya dikasih formulir, banyak pertanyaan lah ya, macam-macam gitu. 
termasuk juga bagaimana pendapat Anda terhadap peristiwa itu, bagaimana penilaian Anda terhadap kebijakan Red Jen Suharto kenal nggak nama Red Jen? Ya saya kalau nggak kenal ya bilang nggak kenal apa ya. Three weeks later, he was stripped of his Indonesian citizenship. Sunkono found himself stranded in the Soviet Union. Tapi nggak boleh pulang. Wah, ini kan jadi timbul kekusutan pikiran juga. Wah, cemas juga saya nggak boleh pulang. Apa artinya saya belajar lima tahun dengan begitu berat, tapi kami dengan tekun melaksanakan tugas negara sekarang nggak boleh pulang. Terus terpikirkan ya, jadi saya ini harus hidup di negeri asing, hidup di tengah-tengah orang asing. Nah, jadi problem lah ini bagaimana saya bisa menempuh kehidupan hari depan ini. Nonetheless, Sunkono finished his studies and in 1967 moved to China. There, three years later, he met Wati. Kesan pertama, ya orangnya ganteng. Kan kenyataan. <laughs> Tapi tidak dalam arti, terus pandangan pertama kami saling mencintai, saya rasa enggak. <laughs> Jalan hidup kami ke depan ini, ya bisa dikatakan, apa, bisa disamakan dengan kata-kata puisi, bukan jalan bertabur bunga, tapi penuh dengan onak buduri. Jadi saya merasa kalau saya hidup harus berkeluarga, harus punya pasangan hidup, ya saya merasa dia lebih cocok untuk jalan ke depan itu. The couple would wed in China, and in 1981, they moved to the Netherlands with their son to join Wati's parents, who had already settled there. Wati and Sunkono applied for and received Dutch citizenship. But Wati's father, Sukrisno, would die a man without a country. Dia tetap bertahan sebagai stateless, memang nggak bisa kemana-mana, bapak itu. Tapi dia bilang, tidak, saya bekas duta besarnya Bung Karno. Saya diangkat Bung Karno sampai dua kali membangun kedutaan untuk yang pertama di Rumania maupun di Vietnam. Saya tetap berdiri di belakang Bung Karno. Jadi enggak apa-apa, saya tidak pergi, sak pergi, pergi ke manapun, ya enggak apa-apa. Tapi saya tidak mau masuk sebagai mengambil kebanggaan Belanda. Saya tetap orang Indonesia. It is not known how many share Wati and Sunkono's fate. Estimates say there could be 1,500 to thousands of exiles during the purge. Many, like the couple, maintain they are not communists, but rather supporters of Sukarno. And in the 60 years since, the Indonesian government has rarely acknowledged the atrocities committed during the communist purge. A lot of academic research, I think, about the victims, which are coming out now more and more, were written by the Western writers as far as Indonesia is concerned. The time has not come for Indonesia to face the dark past yet. Why is this dark chapter of history rarely discussed in Indonesia? And what really happened? Menyembuhkan luka bangsa, menghapus tutur hitam, membangun ruang setara dalam berbeda. Menyembuhkan luka bangsa, membangun martabat bersama. Putu Oka Sukanta is one of Indonesia's most celebrated writers. He has written more than 20 books that include novels, short stories, and poems. Some of them deal with his bitter experience as a detainee following the attempted coup in 1965. Di penjara kami dilarang mempunyai pensil, dilarang mempunyai buku, dilarang mempunyai kertas untuk menulis apa saja. 
itu salah satu bentuk penyiksaan mental. Bagaimana seorang penulis tidak boleh menulis? Bagaimana seorang intelektual tidak boleh membaca buku? Back then, Putu was an activist at the People's Cultural Institute or LECRA, a socialist group. He was arrested in Jakarta in October 1966, one year after the attempted coup. He was never told why. Yang saya alami, saya disuruh berdiri, baju dibuka, tinggal telana dalam, berdiri, angkat tangan, menghadap tembok, berjinjit, kemudian di bawah uh, apa? Di bawah kaki saya ditaruh rokok yang sedang menyala, sehingga kalau nggak tahan. Saya menginjak api rokok, kemudian saya jatuh, digebugin dengan tangan, digebugin dengan kursi, seolah-olah dengan ekor pari. Ada orang lain yang distrum, saya tidak distrum. Ada orang lain yang distrum, distrum kemaluannya, distrum kakinya, sampai terkuing-kuing menggeliat-geliat. Berdarah-darah keluar. Putu spent 10 years in detention without trial. As many as three million were estimated to have been interned on suspicion of links with the PKI. They were sent to detention centers in West Java, Aceh, East Kalimantan, Bali, and Buru Island in the Moluccas. Most of the detainees were never tried. Some would never taste freedom again. Pada malam hari ada orang yang datang. Tentunya itu tentara dan yang datang dan uh, ngebon, dibon gitu, artinya dipinjam, dipinjam dari tempat penahanan itu dan dibawa ke satu tempat. Bagaimana cara mereka dibunuh? Mereka dibunuh uh, tidak dengan menggunakan alat yang yang canggih ya seperti uh, kamar gas Nazi dan lain-lain, tetapi dengan alat yang sederhana, dengan parang, dengan golok uh, ataupun juga dengan uh, senjata gitu. Dengan juga cara yang sangat mudah gitu. Jadi mereka dibawa kalau di Solo itu, misalnya uh, di ke Sungai uh, Bacem dan kemudian mereka diikat, diberi pemberat dan kemudian ditenggelamkan ke sungai uh, supaya tenggelam uh, dan itu cara pembunuhan atau di goa yang dalam gitu, di, kemudian ditinggal di, didorong gitu. The killings did not take place just in the detention centers. Across the country, the PKI and its affiliated group, the Peasants Front of Indonesia, or BTI, faced the ire of right-winged factions. BTI and its aggressive land reform campaign had previously angered many landowners. The landlords and the youth belonging to NU This Ansor and Pemuda the Pancasila came out and make their revenge, quote unquote. Uh, and the revenge in it was sadistic, cruel, you know, inhuman. The mass killing did not really happen in the urban areas, but they had happened indeed in the rural area where the land reform and one sided actions, I think, were launched. And these areas include North Sumatra, Central Java, East Java, and Bali. These declassified documents show that the Americans were aware of the killings. But this was the height of the Cold War. If not directly condoned, at least a blind eye was turned to the crushing of communists. This is the large number of the victims, you know, in 1965 and 66. Yet the Western states, you know, remain silent. At first, they remain silent. Yeah, it is understandable because this was indeed, I think, uh, what they wanted to see as far as the result was concerned. That is. Sukarno was overthrown, the PKI was eliminated. The West were very happy. Azvi Warman Adam 
has written a number of books on this chapter of Indonesia's history. According to him, documents show the United States funded a campaign called Action Committee to suppress the 30th September movement. Juga ada arsip yang sudah dibuka juga menyebutkan bahwa Amerika memberikan bantuan uh, kepada Indonesia itu uh, 2 juta US dollar. Nah, itu bantuan alat-alat telekomunikasi. Tetapi alat-alat telekomunikasi ini dihitamkan dua halaman gitu. Nah, saya menduga gitu. Kalau alat telekomunikasi mungkin tidak sebanyak itu ya. Uh, nilainya setinggi itu. Jadi kemungkinan itu senjata. The violence soon spread to the Indonesian Chinese community. In cities like Jakarta, Medan, Semarang and Surabaya, a number of Chinese were beaten, tried and sentenced to prison. Dedi Dinarto is Indonesian Chinese, whose grandfather was among those arrested in North Sumatra. My grandfather was arrested by a group of uh, uh, people. Uh, they stormed uh, his house, uh, and inside the house uh, was my grandmother uh, with uh, three of their daughters, and one of them being my uh, mother. So my grandmother um, uh, went away uh, with my elder uh, auntie, and then my second elder auntie uh, carried my mom uh, on, on her back, and they uh, ran away to the Chinese graveyard. So what they did was uh, hiding in an empty tomb, uh, waiting until the condition was uh, stable. So it was a very, very uh, traumatic um, uh, experience for my mom because um, she was still five years old at that time. Daddy's grandfather was eventually released, but the scars of this ordeal were not so easily erased. For my mom, whenever she uh, told me this story, uh, she will always have these three seconds or four seconds of silence and uh, she will cry. So uh, I think it, it, it badly uh, impacted uh, my mom's uh, uh, sort of like a mental. I would say that the events uh, from uh, 1965 to 1966 constitute a violent act committed by the military at that time and uh, I think it's driven by a misperception that the Chinese community in Indonesia is part of uh, uh, the Indonesian Communist Party. Suharto would become president in 1968. His new order government lasted for 32 years. The ideological campaign against suspected communists would continue during his tenure. Jadi uh, sepanjang Orde Baru itu uh, dilakukan diskriminasi dan stigma dan orang-orang uh, yang kemudian mengkritik pemerintah itu dengan gampang dicap uh, PKI ataupun orang-orang yang tidak mau menyerahkan tanahnya kepada negara gitu itu bisa dicap menghambat pembangunan pasti PKI. Former detainees were banned from working for the government or in professions like teaching, journalism, law, acting and others. Putu had to rebuild his life after his release from detention in 1976. He became a book salesman and once worked for a company that makes name cards. He eventually became a full-time acupuncturist, skills that he secretly learned during detention. He set up a herbal garden in Bogor, 60 kilometers from Jakarta, offering alternative treatment. Setiap orang dalam hidup ini kan dia mau berbuat. Nah saya sebagai orang salah satu warga negara Indonesia yang pernah berada dalam kemelutnya situasi bangsa dengan berbagai macam tuduhan, stempel, stigmatisasi dan lain sebagainya ingin menunjukkan bahwa saya ini adalah manusia. Balas dendam itu penyakit yang menghabiskan energi. Saya nggak mau itu. Biarkan dia, dia, dia berjalan, dia melakukan apa, dia akan menerima akibatnya. In the decades since Putu's release, Indonesia has changed. 
Suharto was ousted in 1998 after deadly riots during the Asian financial crisis. Indonesia transitioned to democracy. Thus began calls to investigate what happened during 1965 and 1966. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in 2004, but scrapped soon after by a constitutional court ruling. Dari awal reformasi ini ada selalu gitu ada upaya untuk meminta uh, pemerintah itu meminta maaf kepada korban korban pelanggaran ham berat. Tetapi uh, di sisi yang lain juga ada pihak yang mengatakan pemerintah jangan meminta maaf kepada PKI gitu. Kalangan yang uh, dulu terlibat di dalam uh, pelanggaran ham berat itu, jadi kalangan uh, tentara dan juga mereka yang membantu tentara. But things might be changing. In 2019, there were talks of reviving it again. And then earlier this year, President Widodo made a stunning admission. Dengan pikiran yang jernih dan hati yang tulus, saya sebagai kepala negara Republik Indonesia mengakui bahwa pelanggaran hak asasi manusia yang berat memang terjadi di berbagai peristiwa dan saya sangat menyesalkan terjadinya peristiwa pelanggaran hak asasi manusia yang berat. What does this mean for exiles? Will they be able to return to a home they barely know? di Solo, Jawa Tengah, tahun 1944-1944. Kami berempat, empat bersaudara. Satu pertama perempuan, kemudian kedua laki-laki, ketiga laki-laki. Eh, perempuan, terus baru saya. Saya yang paling kecil. In 1965, Amina Idris received a scholarship to study medicine in Bulgaria. She left Indonesia in September, 10 days before the coup. In 1966, she found herself summoned by the Indonesian embassy in Sofia. She was asked to denounce Sukarno. Amina declined. Kami menganggap kami ini dulu dikirim oleh Sukarno. Dan kemudian kami suruh, suruh me, mengutuk lah, tidak menyetujui lagi uh, Isukarno. Itu salah satunya yang, yang berat untuk kami. I think some of them at that particular times were perhaps very naive. Some of them really believe uh, in the ideology. Some of them really believe in Sukarno and the follower of Sukarno. And then uh, many of them perhaps uh, sympathetic to the left-wing movement. I think they are very enthusiastic, you know. And they too have been indoctrinated. Being loyal to Sukarno came with a price. Amina was asked to surrender her passport. In return, she was given this. Ini surat dari uh, Kedutaan Besar Republik Indonesia di Sofia. Ya ini pernyataannya, ya surat keterangan berlaku laksana paspor. Yang berlaku hanya berlaku untuk di Bulgaria saja. Jadi tidak bisa untuk keluar. Stateless, Amina continued her studies and became a specialist in contagious disease. She worked as a pediatrician in Bulgaria, where she met her husband, also an Indonesian. Ini waktu uh, pernikahan kami di Bulgaria. Ini uh, kami, ini suami saya, ini uh, saya, dan ini baby kami. Waktu kami keluar dari uh, rumah sakit bersalin. Dalam kondisi seperti itu, ada yang meminta menjadi uh, warga negara, uh, misalnya uh, Uni Soviet gitu. Uh, 
itu juga yang terjadi di, di uh, berbagai negara. Ada yang yang uh, hidup atau tinggal di berbagai negara, tetapi memakai uh, paspor apa yang dikeluarkan oleh uh, PBB atau Palang Merah uh, Internasional gitu. Uh, itu yang yang apa namanya itu yang uh, mereka pegang, tetapi tidak bisa ke ke Indonesia. Amina's family settled in the Netherlands in 1990 and became Dutch citizens. But she could not practice medicine as the qualifications were not recognized. Di Belanda saya sempat bekerja di pabrik pernah, tapi yang yang lama itu saya bekerja sebagai guru taman kanak-kanak. Nearly 70 Indonesian exiles live in the Netherlands. The Netherlands once colonized Indonesia, which they called the Dutch East Indies. Ironically, this colonial relationship made the pathway to Dutch citizenship easier for the exiles. Belanda menganggap bahwa uh, sampai uh, tahun 49 uh, negara ini masih Hindia Belanda gitu. Jadi mereka masih merupakan kaula apa uh, Hindia Belanda gitu. Jadi uh, oleh sebab itu mereka yang uh, kelahiran uh, sebelum tahun 49 itu uh, lebih mudah untuk menjadi warga negara uh, Belanda gitu. Itu sebabnya uh, eksil yang paling banyak itu uh, adalah di Belanda. For Sunkono, his exile had a personal cost. For years, he had to cut contact with his family. Karena kita sudah dapat berita bahwa per tahun itu pembantaian sudah masal, ya. Pembunuhan di mana-mana, seluruh Nusantara kita gak ada tempat yang loros dari pengejaran, pembantaian, pemenjaraan dan sebagainya. Dan sudah banyak pesan, jangan berkirim surat ke tanah air, karena itu membahayakan keluarga kita di tanah air. He was also unable to return home. Saya sendiri itu memang sangat dekat sama ibu saya itu. Jadi saya merasalah ibu saya kan makin tua, tapi malam justru nggak bisa ketemu. Apakah ada keharapan saya bisa ketemu lagi? Three decades after the coup, with a Dutch passport, Sunkono returned to his hometown in North Sumatra. But it was too late for a mother-son reunion. Dan pada waktu saya pulang tahun 8, dari 1995 itu ya saya tinggal menemui ya kuburannya lah. Ya saya hanya nggak bisa nggak bisa ketemu lagi sama beliau. Ya hanya bisa menaburkan bunga dan air mata lah di kuburan itu. Nah ini memang berat beban yang berat kadang-kadang sampai sekarang pun masih timbul. Sunkono and his wife Wati has since returned to Indonesia several times as tourists, each time bringing back artifacts that show their roots. But for others, life in the Netherlands is a chance at a new future. Like Wati, Heru Mintajo is the child of an exiled Indonesian. His late father, Sadijo Mindajo died in 2015. How do you define yourself? A proud holder of a Dutch passport. I'm not a fan of an exile. No, it's very comfortable to link, uh, to have a link with uh, my father and his past. But uh, it's his past, it's not my past. I want to look forward. I want to positive mind. So not to, to be in the past and talk about every time what happened in 1960, 1970, I don't know, uh, in, in, in the spirit of that time, right? Don't forget, but forgive and uh, move on. But not all the exiles were so ready to move on. Yeah, bagaimana ya itu? Saya kira sulit juga di itu kan. Jadi misalnya, ya, 
kita kan apa namanya orang yang dibuang itu kayak orang yang dibuang itu bagaimana rasanya orang yang dibuang itu saya kira itu sulit saya menceritakan ya kalau stigma itu misalnya kalau kita ketemu dengan orang Indonesia sendiri orang Indonesia kan Uh, ya kita nggak tahu kalau udah nggak kenal ya uh, apakah dia itu uh, me, juga mencap saya sebagai eksil sebagai orang yang dibuang nah, itu kan sulit. For exiles like Amina, time is running out to find some sort of peace. In 2000, an estimated 600 exiles lived in the Netherlands, China, Cuba, Albania, Sweden. France and Russia. The number has dwindled to around 130 now, as many have died of old age. Earlier this year, when President Joko Widodo acknowledged the atrocities of the past, he also promised to restore the exiles' citizenship. Can the exiles finally call themselves Indonesians again? Having shared the same fate, the Indonesian exiles in the Netherlands are a tight-knit community. And in August, many of them attended a historic meeting in Diemen, a district of Amsterdam, coordinating political, legal and security affairs minister Mahfoud MD and human rights minister Yasona Lauli met with more than 50 exiles living in the Netherlands and Germany. Others participated via Zoom. The government promised to restore their citizenship to those who wanted it, or special multi-entry visas for those who choose not to. But the ministers stopped short of apologizing. Pemerintah sekarang ini itu pemerintah reformasi memaksa pemerintah Orde Baru itu turun. Dan kita sudah memaksanya turun. Lalu kita disuruh minta maaf kepada siapa? Uang kita sudah nurunkan mereka yang seharusnya minta maaf. Seharusnya mereka yang minta maaf kepada kita. Bukan malah kita juga disuruh minta maaf itu terbalik. Gitu. Dan itu dalam pikiran kami. This was not well received by the exiles. Mereka tidak mau minta maaf karena mereka masih mau melindungi orang-orang yang yang sekarang masih ya masih punya kedudukan atau uh, itu di pemerintahan ataupun pihak-pihak pihak-pihak yang masih uh, mereka ingin lindungi. Jadi pada itunya untuk me melindungi tidak saja uh, golongan dari uh, saya kira loh tidak dari tidak saja dari pihak militer tapi juga di luar militer pun masih banyak sekali yeah. yang masih mendukung rezim Soeharto. Pernyataan minta maaf itu harus dinyatakan secara jelas. Jadi bukan hanya ya mm -hmm. uh, dengan diberi mau dia ya, yang mau jadi kembali jadi WNI akan diberi. Uh, di samping itu akan juga ini juga bukan menyatakan teman-teman uh, atau saudara-saudara atau saudara-saudari akan mendapatkan ini, tetapi juga Klausulnya itu harus minta. Di sini bukan kita kayak mau ngemis-ngemis. Additionally, the parliamentary decree that bans the PKI and Marxism-Leninism issued after the 1965 coup attempt remains in place. Kalau dari kalangan kami eksil di beri pemulihan ke warga negara, pulang ke Indonesia, itu masalah keselamatan kami pun belum belum ada jaminan. Karena misalnya eh, TAP 25 itu kan masih mengekang setiap warga negara siapa saja yang dituduh menyebarkan Marxisme itu dengan sendirinya bisa ditangkap, bisa dijebloskan ke penjara and restoring the exile citizenship is not straightforward. Indonesia does not recognize dual citizenship. 
the exiles, many in their 70s and 80s, may find little reasons to give up their current passports. Karena sebagian besar dari mereka, hampir semua itu sudah menjadi warga negara di tempat mereka tinggal. Uh, yang mereka uh, harapkan itu adalah yang pertama pengungkapan kebenaran dan yang uh, kedua uh, permohonan maaf dari pemerintah. Saya sendiri tidak tidak melihat di sini aspek apa dui keluarga negaraan itu sangat sangat uh, menonjol tidak. Tetapi yang lebih penting bagi mereka adalah pengumpulan kebenaran. Back in Indonesia, some are pushing the government to go further to acknowledge what happened six decades ago. Ilam Aidit has been campaigning for reconciliation between the government and victims of the purge. When Ilam was six years old, his father, Deepa Nusantara Aidit, the chair of PKI, was executed. His mother was detained for 15 years. His sisters exiled in Moscow. Bahwa sebetulnya rekonsiliasi itu mempunyai empat prasyarat mutlak. Kalau saya boleh ulang ya, satu adalah acknowledgement, pengakuan terhadap perbuatan. Yang kedua adalah telling the truth, pengungkapan fakta-fakta kebenaran. Yang ketiga adalah public remorse, pernyataan penyesalan di muka publik. Dan baru kemudian rehabilitasi, rekonsiliasi, restitusi, dan sebagainya. Jadi ada empat tahapan. Itu sesuatu yang menurut saya logis sekali bahwa meminta maaf kepada orang-orang yang tidak diadili tapi dihukum 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 tahun, ya tentu harus minta maaf. For some, President Jokowi's acknowledgement is an important step in the right direction. Setelah mengakui itu, itu yang sangat-sangat penting bagi saya gitu. Pengakuan itu sangat penting karena itu tidak pernah di, dilakukan oleh Presiden sebelumnya, mengakui bahwa itu merupakan pengungkapan kebenaran, bagian dari pengungkapan kebenaran. Tetapi yang yang lainnya yang dituntut mereka itu adalah tadi permintaan maaf gitu. Saya melihat menyesalkan itu sudah sebagian dari dari maaf gitu. Tidak sampai kepada maaf tapi menyesalkan. Menyesalkan itu ya pertama mengakui dan yang yang kedua merasa uh, ada perasaan bersalah di situ gitu. For others it falls short. Jadi Sebetulnya kalau saya pengen sinis bicara bahwa negara tidak perlu berbangga bahwa mereka sudah menyelesaikan pelanggaran berat dengan memberikan ini itu segala macam. Yang mereka berikan, yang negara berikan ini itu segala macam, itu nggak seberapa dengan derita dan pemenjaraan yang sekian tahun. Nggak ada seberapa. But time may be running out for the victims or their families to get their apology. The Indonesian presidential election is slated for early 2024. President Jokowi's successor may not be as keen on reconciliation. For one, current frontrunner Prabowo Subianto is a former general who serves as defense minister. He was the commander of Indonesia's special forces in the late 1990s and was the son-in-law of former President Suharto. I think it is very difficult for him to do, uh, I think, anything. In fact, he himself, you know, also has the violation of the human rights record. I do not think that he would, he would pursue, I think, the issue. Whether we like it or not, the military is a, remains a very powerful political force in the Indonesian politics, and as long as they're in a political scene, I don't think that any government wants to commit uh, with an apology. But even a non-military aligned president may be reluctant to open this can of political worms. I feel rather pessimistic, you know. I mean, if you see the examples in other places of the world, I mean like Armenia, Guatemala, and so this, this, this is all dragging on, dragging on, and nothing is solved. And even in the countries where they have TRCs, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, the situation was not really solved as well. I mean, there were setbacks. 
the measures that were taken, watered down or turned back by the next government, etc. So, I mean, I'm pessimistic, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to to keep on advocating for the rights of victims. For Wati and Sunkono, they have built a life for themselves in Amsterdam. In this photo, we are in Prancis. This is also in Prancis. This is a photo of the second one, the wanita wanita. Anak perempuan kami bersama saya dan kedua cucu anaknya dia. But in their hearts, the injustice they faced remains unresolved. Oh, kalau bapak masih hidup, tentunya bapak mungkin bisa ke Indonesia lagi. Ya, tapi dalam kenyataannya ya sudah lain lah. Sebelum tutup usia, ya saya harapkan. Perjuangan untuk keadilan ini akan berlangsung terus, ya dari generasi ke generasi itu tidak boleh dilupakan, tidak, tidak bisa eh, di, diabaikan ini masalah keadilan dan ini menyangkut juga sejarah bangsa Indonesia. Saya mengharapkan kejadian 65 itu tidak akan terjadi lagi dan sekarang supaya apa namanya? Kebenaran itu ditegakkan lah.